I'd, I'd now like to ask uh, C C Professor Capatio, uh, Professor of Otolaryngology, University of Milan in Italy, to come forward and talk to us about the uh, surgical management of uh, submandibular gland stones. Uh, before we got started today, it was uh, very nice to, to hear the speakers talk together. Um, they're all very good friends and they've traveled around the place and it's wonderful to hear them talk about their experiences, uh, you know, problems they've had and how they've dealt with them. And it's a pleasure to welcome, you, welcome you, Professor Capatio to the uh, stadium. Thank you, Professor Stanson. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank Professor McGurk for the invitation. And uh, I'm very honored to be involved in this symposium together with, with all my teachers. To plan an adequate strategy, we need a good diagnosis. Ultrasonography is to be considered a first level imaging technique and also the best, the, the preferred option technique in experienced hands to detect stones, but sometimes we are unable to detect stones and we need an objective method of evaluation such as traditional CT or the combined three-dimensional CT in order to plan the strategy. Uh, making diagnosis with ultrasonography is quite simple. You can see uh, the stone, the dilation of the duct proximal to the stone, and you can also see with the use of power Doppler um, the vascularization, the increase of vascularization during acute obstruction. But we know that sonography does not allow reliable exclusion of small salivary gland calculi, especially those less than three millimeter. That is why this recent publication could be a good idea, especially for those small stones located in the, the main duct that can be uh, found with the use of a, a US, scan, uh, US device with lateral scanning that can be used also during surgery when you perform transoral surgery but sometimes you cannot find stones, and so we need a traditional CT scan, or I now I'm using, I prefer Combin 3D uh, CT in order to reduce the dose of radiation. And here you can see uh, a case uh, of uh, some mandibular stones that can be been adequately located into uh, uh, the oral floor, and you can adequately uh, define the, the exact position of the stone, uh, the shape of the stone, and the size of the stone. So, especially for some vanibular stones, is a good technique, and you are, you, as a maxillofacial surgeon, you, uh, you perform convincing CT for every, every things you do. Uh, with regard to uh, therapy, paradoxically, uh, salodenectomy is still the treatment of choice of salivary stones in most can countries. But now we have a modern scenario that is full of opportunities, such as interventional salendoscopy, extracorporeal and, and intracorporeal lithotripsy, interventional radiology, botulinum toxin therapy, and finally, transoral surgery and endoscopically assisted transoral surgery for some mandibular stones. Uh, four years ago, I described my indication for some mandibular, some mandibular stones, saying that uh, transoral surgical removal of stones is indicated for all ductal and dealer stones that, were, that are at least four millimeter and also Iloparenchymal stones more than seven millimeter may undergo transoral endoscopical assisted removal of stones. And four years after, I simply modified my indications and I started with uh, endoscopic intracorporeal laser lithotripsy as long as we are moving 
towards cell endoscopic techniques and so uh, the possibility to use uh, a laser system to break the stone is a good idea and so I'm using the uh, endoscopic laser system as an alternative to extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy for iloparenchymal stones intermediate three to seven millimeter or for pure intraparenchymal stones as an alternative to extracorporeal lithotripsy. Here is extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy. I started with this technique 20 years ago. In my experience and that of German and French colleague, uh, extracorporeal lithotripsy remains an important therapeutic tool in the management of salolithiasis, especially for parotid stones. But we demonstrated some years ago that extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy is not effective for more than 30% of some mandibular stones, in particular those stones that are located in the iloparenchymal region and that are more than 7 millimeter. And so now I'm using, I'm, my, I'm reducing my indication uh, for extracorporeal lithotripsy. I'm just using extracorporeal lithotripsy in combination with interventional cell endoscopy for intermediate stones, three to seven millimeter, of the proximal third of the main duct and the hilum. And also I'm, I'm performing extracorporeal lithotripsy for pure intraparenchymal stones, more than three millimeter, as an alternative to traditional salad anectomy. And here is the laser system. The major limitation of laser is uh, uh, the possibility to have a ductal perforation after the use of laser system and also to have uh, ductal stenosis as a consequence of the thermal damage of the ductal wall after laser. I started with this procedure. Uh, I'm collecting data. I just add uh, one, one ductal perfor perforation without any consequence for the patient and two ductal stenosis that oblige uh, the patient to uh, have the glandular message to favor uh, the, the cleaning of the, the gland with the saliva. But this is a, a new technique that has to be considered in the future especially because now we have some data concerning laser, the use of laser. One is fr from uh, the French group uh, with tulium liag laser, and the second one is from uh, a, an Italian group that used a nolmium liag laser, like, like in my experience. These can be considered future ind indications for endoscopic laser lithotripsy, uh, unpalpable hiloparenchymal stones, patients unresponsive to extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy, and also as an alternative to extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy for intermediate stones in the proximal third of the main duct and the hilum. And with regard to uh, cell endoscopy, uh, interventional cell endoscopy is now indicated uh, in my experience and also publish, published experience for all mobile floating stones of the main duct up to uh, the hilum, uh, less than five millimeter. But we know in our experience that sometimes you are able to remove by interventional cell endoscopy also stones that are more than five millimeters. It depends on the shape, on the shape of the stone and the possibility to go with a basket uh, behind the stone. So, uh, this is a good technique, but you have to know that during your procedure, you can uh, change your strategy uh, from a simple cell interventional cell endo endoscopy to Endos endoscopical assisted in uh, surgical removal of the stone. Here you can see two stone removed by the basket. As long as we are moving to um, transural techniques, uh, we have the re-emergence of an old technique called simple transural lithectomy 
but you need to know and to remember that doing a simple incision of the oral floor to remove a stone, you may have two uh, normal consequences that are uh, the occurrence, occurrence of a ductal stenosis. Here you can see an MR cellographic uh, sequence and the possibility of the occurrence of a ranula. So you need to know these two things. That is why I prefer to say to you that if you have a narrow duct, it is better to locate a sally stent, a salivary stent, if, you, if the duct is, is really narrow. But if you have a wide and dilated duct, you can uh, adequately do a ductal mars traditional ductal marsupialization or saloducoplasty in order to guarantee the patency of the ductal lumer after the removal of the stone. Here is a simple case of uh, removal of a giant uh, salivary duct stone. Uh, I just want to show you this video because you can uh, clearly uh, see the relationship between uh, the lingual nerve and uh, the main uh, Wharton's duct that is the basis of the transoral conservative uh, procedure. Uh, you know that by opening the oral floor you can adequately see uh, normal anatomy of the, of the oral floor. Here you can see uh, the duct that is pushed up by your colleague and uh, the pushing up with the finger pressure is the, the basis to adequately remove the stone located in the oral floor. Here you can see the relationship with the lingual nerve. Uh, the, the incision was done and down with a minimal incision that is uh, and then the, the preferred way to, to open the knot in, in, in the time of uh, minimal invasive methods. And the stone can be, can be easily removed by elevators and by other instruments in order to favor the release of the stone from the main duct. The, the stone, as you can see here, is a four centimeter stone that, that begins in the main duct but continues also in the parenchymal region. And in this case, you can see also uh, here, here, the angle favored by the myeloid muscle, okay? It is a more, an important thing. You know the, that the myeloid muscle, like the masseter muscle, make a, 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 an angle, an angle to the ductal wall that possibly may favor the formation of a stone. And it is better to perform after marsupialization of the duct a, an endoscopic uh, check for any residual fragments in the, the main duct and also in the heloparenchymal region. This is part of the new way of thinking about minimal invasive procedure for, for some mandibular stones. Let's go on with the, the most important technique, tra surgical technique uh, of a transoral submandibular stone excision. The first, the indication, the first indication for this technique was given by uh, the colleague McDissey from the school of Professor McGurk, and the, the indication is for uh, large, fixed, symptomatic, and palpable iloparenchymal stones confirmed by ultrasound. This is uh, the first important series of patients described by Professor Zeng from Erlangen Group. 116 patients with 93% of periilar stone removed and 64 uh, stones removed in the iloparenchymal region. No more than 1% uh, of lingual nerve damage. This is the description of the technique based on the findings of Professor McGurf with uh, a simple modification that you will uh, see after. And this is a, a, a cooperation 
uh, of the three international teams with results of our technique that were published three years ago. Uh, good results, no, just one gland removal, no persistent lingual nerve paresthesia. These are uh, preoperative examination that uh, it, uh, are performed before, prior to surgery. The most important thing, uh, uh, together with manual palpation of the stone in the oral floor, is ultrasonography. It is important to verify the relationship between the stone and the myeloid muscle in order to check for the position of the stone in the ilar or periilar region. Here is the technique. The technique is, is performed in my experience and also in uh, other experience uh, under general anesthesia. I said before that uh, the most important thi thing du during the procedure is uh, the pushing up the external finger pressure that may favor uh, the, 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 may favor the pushing up of the gland and of the ductal system into the oral floor. Here you can see three uh, video sequence sequences of uh, the two techniques. The, the first technique is the Erlangen technique that is based on uh, prolonged duct, duct dissection and removal of the, the stone at the level of the, il, the, of the helum of the gland. And uh, the London and Milan technique that is based on the conservation of the entire ductal system. So we do uh, perform the incision directly into the ilar region or, or into the parenchyma. But you need to know all, both techniques, as sometimes I use this technique, that the prolonged duct dissection, especially when you have ductal stenosis distal to the stone. It is better to open up the duct and then remove the stone. But According to uh, the new technique, the new salendoscopic techniques, as you can see here, by, by making the conservation of the entire duct, you may be able to have a check during surgery and also to have a postoperative check, endoscopic check at the end of the procedure. Okay. So we are... This is... We are quite at the end of the procedure, that is the prolonged duct dissection, uh, the technique described by the Erlangen group. And here we are in the parenchyma of the gland, where we are, doing, we are making the, a simple, a minimal incision of the parenchyma, and then you can enter with the, the elevator in order to detach the stone that is blocked into the parenchyma in order to favor the removal of the stone. This is to be considered a minimal invasive technique as you preserve everything. We have a functional preservation of the entire gland and the, system of the, and the ductal system. Here is the removal of the stone. Uh, I prefer to put a net of uh, tabotamp or surgical in order to, uh, to have an hemostatic and antibacterial activity in order to cover the area of the incision. Sometimes I put a venflon tube in order to uh, guarantee the patency of the ductal lumen. And in the upper part you can see the ilar marsupialization uh, after the removal of the stone. Let's go on. It's not okay. Okay, and this is the final uh, video sequence that I want to show you because this represent, represents what we are trying to do now in order to reduce the area of incision of the oral floor uh, to uh, reduce the tension of the oral floor, uh, of the scar of the oral floor referred by the patient after surgery. We have the possibility to reduce the area of the incision on the stone by uh, doing a salendoscopy through 
the main ductal system, and by uh, following the transillumination of the duct uh, until till the position of the stone in the in the parenchymal iloparenchymal area. Uh, by by this way, you can reduce uh, the the area of the incision of in the oral floor. As you can see here, the duct, the Wharton's duct, is visible, and you can check the ductal system by the saloendoscopic uh, transillumination in order to be sure to make a, an adequate incision of the ilar region. Uh, by, if you stay on the lingual side of the ductal wall uh, and up to the, the ductal system, you don't have any problem with regard to lingual uh, nerve damage. So the most important thing is to stay on the lingual side of the oral floor. Here you can see the stone that is located after the incision and that can be removed, easily removed in one piece or in multiple pieces. Uh, we have two typical situations. The possibility to remove the stone in one piece, that is the best situation, but sometimes the stone breaks, breaks in multiple pieces, and in this case you have the possibility to leave in the iloparenchymal area residual fragments. That's why it is better to, to have, after surgery, a saloendoscopic check of the iloparenchymal area to remove residual fragments after the removal of the main stone. Okay, here is the net of surgical at the end of the procedure. Okay, and based on mm, this video sequence, uh, you can understand the recent publication of uh, Chang and Eisel, uh, where they described a limited distal salodocotomy to facilitate salendoscopy of the submandibular duct. So you may have two incisions, the first anterior to make a salodocoplasty and to favor the, a, a good introduction of the salendoscopic, salendoscopic unit and a second incision posterior in the iloparenchymal region. That can be the future of this technique. Uh, when do we have to use uh, endoscopy during transoral surgery. In my experience, I used uh, endoscopy, salendoscopy, only in uh, 13 patients. Uh, three patients uh, through the papillar ostium to locate a pure intraparenchymal stone, and uh, 10 patients through the ilar opening to check for any residual stones. So you don't need to use salendoscopy every time, but you need an endoscopic, salendoscopic unit in your surgical field. As if you need it, you can use it. Okay, postoperative complications uh, are, are very limited. Uh, we just have a uh, uh, few ranulas, uh, few ilar stenosis uh, that are the main, the main uh, persistent complications. The postoperative care is, is important to check uh, to verify the, the secretion of the salivary duct system and also the ultrasonographic evaluation in order to verify uh, the, the patency of the, the ductal lumen and the iloparenchymal uh, region. This is a, a recent published manuscript together with the school of Professor Megur where we demonstrated that we have some residual fragments after transoral surgery, especially in those patients who previously underwent a cycle of extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy. That's why now I prefer uh, to, uh, to have a naive patient with no previous extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy. Uh, and with regard to failure during transoral surgery, you have to consider the, consider the possibility to have a failure you may have the possibility to not uh, be able to eliminate the stone. I have 2% of failure in the case of deep intraparenchymal stones. And so in this case, it is better when you know that, that you cannot adequately palpate the stone in the oral floor, you may consider the possibility in the informed consent 
uh, to have a concomitant salodenectomy, especially for difficult cases. Finally, my conclusions are that interventional salendoscopy is an effective procedure for floating stones less than five millimeter. Extracorporeal lithotripsy can be used in combination with salendoscopy for intermediate stones of the main duct and the hilum and for intraparenchymal stones. Endoscopic assisted transoral surgery is an effective procedure for all palpable and impacted stones located in the proximal third of the main duct and the iloparenchymal area. And the laser endoscop endoscopic intracorporeal laser uh, lithotripsy can be used for stones unresponsive to extracorporeal lithotripsy and for unpalpable iloparenchyma stones. All of these techniques participate in the modern management of salivary stones with the aim of preserving the affected gland. And we know that the majority, majority of large salivary gland calculi can be removed by the gland by preserving the gland, and this casts doubt on the commonly held premise that salivary stones normally lead, lead to chronic saladenitis, which is the basis for the current policy of saladenectomy. You have to know that during uh, transoral techniques, you may move from a simple salendoscopy to a endoscopically assisted transoral surgery. And so the patient has to be informed about this possibility that you are not doing only salendoscopy, but you may necessitate an incision of the oral floor. But we, by using all this technique, we are able to reduce indication to traditional salodenectomy in only 3% of cases, as you can see in this uh, international uh, study. And these are, in my, in my experience, residual indications for salodenectomy that, is, that are based on failure of conservative and minimal invasive technique, massive symptomatic intraparenchymal salolithiasis, iller stenosis after transoral removal of iloparenchymal stones, and finally, complications of interventional salendoscopy, such as basket entrapment in the iller region. Thank you very much. Well, Professor Capaccio, can I ask you to come here and sit here because we need to modify the podium. Can you sit here for a second? That's fresh water. Um, just before we start, I'd just like to ask one question there. You actually talk about cone beam CT scan. Are you, are you doing that for every stone that, you, that presents in the submandibular uh, duct? No, uh, I use, uh, I perform uh, ultrasonography as the first imaging technique, and I'm able to detect stones in most of the cases. Sometimes you have a contradiction between the suspicion of a stone and uh, a negative ultrasonographic findings. In, in this case, I use combine three-dimensional CT. And you're doing the ultrasound yourself? and on your follow-ups, you're doing it yourself? Uh, I'm able to, to, to make ultrasonography, even though I prefer to, to, to contact uh, the, my radiologist. In, and in, uh, you know that is the most important thing is to have an experienced radiologist. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to perform traditional objective methods of evaluation. Right. Can, I, can I ask anybody from the floor to have any uh, questions for Professor Capatio? You'll have to put your hands up because we can't see you very clearly. Yes, go ahead, yes. yes. Thank you. We can do everything with uh, endoscopy. And especially as uh, submandibular stones are the common stones for us, 80% of all stones, what do you think? How often do you only use the endoscope for mobile stones in this topic? And how often do you really go for opera uh, operation? or combined, even combined approaches? In my experience, prob probably because I see a lot of patients coming from every part of Italy with big stones, large stones, so <laughs> I perform a lot of, of transural yes. surgery. Okay, so transor endoscopic assisted transural surgery now is the main technique for me. Uh, and sometimes I use salendoscopy to remove small mobile stones, okay? In, this, in, my, in my experience, I see 
uh, a good number of big stones that, that may be removed by a transural technique, surgical technique. That, that's the same what, what we see. I think it was only 4% of all stones that could be removed because they were mobile. Yeah. And because the other techniques are faster and easy yeah. to do. I agree with you. And we use the endoscope normally just to check whether we see the stone within the hilum. And that then, even if it's not palpable, we just go for transoral removal, even if we cannot palpate. If you see the stone yes, yes. in the hilum, now, do you think now the same? Now I'm performing salendoscopy every time prior to surgery in order to check and to verify the presence of a annular stone that could not be palpate, palpated by the oral check. And then you go for transoral removal. And then I go to transoral removal. Great. Peter. Thank, thank, you very, thank you very much. Um, in the previous talk, we heard uh, em emphasis of how important a uh, stent is afterwards. You didn't mention stenting at all. Is it different in the submandibular duct to the parotid duct? Uh, I, I don't, I don't in insert uh, this, the stent every time. It depends, uh, it depends of, on, on, the, on the lumen of the duct. As, as I said before, uh, I, can, I can use the traditional marsupialization of the duct after transoral surgery. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the duct, uh, ductal stones, not iloparenchymal stones. Okay? Uh, so if you, if you go for a surgery of the duct, you need a, a salodocoplasty or a stenting inside the ductal system. If you go for transoral surgery for iloparenchymal stones, you, mm, you, don't need, you don't need the stent because you make the incision, the incision directly to the ilar region or to the parenchyma of the gland. So you don't need the stent in these cases. Uh, thank you very much. I think we better stop and move on. Uh, but I must compliment you on your research that you're doing multi uh, international Discipline, research, yeah. and I think it's wonderful to see. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your English is perfect, better than <laughs> mine. Thank you. Thank you very much.